Hey guys, welcome back to another STEM Sunday. My name is Bailey Burns and I'm a Rubik's Cube ambassador. I'm working towards creating a science experiment where I use Rubik's Cubes in microgravity, space-like environments. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, first of all, I want to give you guys an update of how things are going. I'm still training. Um, so if you're just tuning in, I'm training to be able to solve a Rubik's Cube in under 20 seconds for a parabolic flight. Um, this parabolic flight basically means we fly in a parabola and uh, like an arc like that. And on the downside, we basically get what feels like zero gravity, like what they feel up in space. So I need to be able to solve the Rubik's Cube in that 20 seconds that we get that feeling so that I can do my experiment right. Um, it's very difficult. I did not start this process out as a speed cuber. So I've been kind of learning tips and tricks. And this week I actually had a really cool experiment uh, experience where Kevin Hayes, um, one of the best Rubik's Cube solvers I know, one of the best cubers, um, he took some time to analyze my solves and just give me some tips. Um, so first of all, I wanted to share those tips with you guys because I think they were super cool. Um, the first one, I learned about this thing called the sledgehammer. That was really cool. That is a sneaky move, guys. It is a great way to get um, everything kind of lined up in just four easy turns. Um, that's a real game changer for me. Right now, I'm working on implementing it in all of my solves. Um, so it's a little awkward right now. Um, but once I kind of get the hang of it, it's just going to flow really nicely into my solves. And hopefully I can even knock, you know, one or two seconds off of my time. So that was really exciting. Um, I got a bunch of other really cool tips. If you guys are interested, he has his video up on Twitch and on YouTube and all those good things. Um, so yeah, go check him out. Uh, it was a great opportunity. The two big things that I'll be doing now since that, um, I'm going to be working on PLL algorithms. So if you guys know what that is, um, also, if you guys are good at those, let me know. <laughs> Help me out because I'm working on those PLL alg algorithms right now. And the other thing is that I'm going to be working on solving the cross uh, while not looking, basically like blindfolded. Um, so I always solve the green cross first. So I was going to do it real quick to see if I can do. So basically that means, um, <laughs> oh gosh, I don't know if I can do this like under pressure. Uh, so I'm going to look at where all the, the colors, where all the cubes that I want are. And we're going to see if I can do this without looking. Okay. Ooh, this is much harder than I remember. Oh gosh, I'm gonna have to look. I forgot where that one was. Oh, okay, that wasn't too bad. Okay, I I got I got a three of the four. Oh, see, I missed the orange one because I thought it was on the other side. So I was pretty close. That's not bad. Uh, so I'm working on it. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, let's see what else do I have for you guys. So um, the biggest thing I wanted to talk about today on STEM Sunday was why why I'm doing this. Why this even kind of matters. Um, who even wants to solve a Rubik's Cube in space? Other than the fact I do, I'd love to go to space one day to solve a Rubik's Cube. Um, how do I see this tying into my job and my future dreams? Um, so the biggest thing is that I keep talking about and I want to explain it a little bit more is that Rubik's Cubes relate to spatial awareness very, very well. And spatial awareness is something that astronauts uh, are very good at. And actually when they're deciding who gets to become an astronaut, they look at spatial awareness, cognitive ability, all those things that we're talking about. Um, so yeah, when there's an astronaut selection process, they have a lot of requirements such as uh, you need to have a master's degree or a PhD um, or something equivalent like being a test pilot or a medical doctor, some very high level of um, education. They also look for uh, fitness, you know, I work out every morning trying to get in shape and everything like that. Um, there's swimming requirements, all sorts of different things like that. And then they also take you through testing. Um, there's a lot of this testing involves like uh, emotional and mental health of, um, you know, can you handle stressful environments and working in a team? Um, obviously, there's a physical aspect to it as well, but there is also a spatial awareness part of all this testing, and it kind of relates to how IQ testing works, um, but basically what we're looking at is, uh, well, like I said, spatial awareness. Spatial awareness basically is, um, there's a lot of different de definitions for it, so feel free to like Google it, tell me what Wikipedia says, but basically it means you can conceptualize what is happening in the physical world um, in your head. Um, that's one of the best ways to explain it. Um, and I actually pulled up this. This is something you'll see a lot on like IQ tests. Hopefully you guys can see that. Um, and so you have to think, okay, so if the gear's turning this way, 
okay, what does all that mean down here? So that's a really good example of what spatial awareness can do for you. It helps you see something and be able to piece it together in your head. Um, it also has the rotational mechanics that, that Rubik's Cube, that we do so much with all these cubes. Um, so it's a really good example. That's a question that they would ask the astronauts that hopefully um, I would have kind of a leg up on that question because I can, I can think about things in that way. The other thing spatial awareness uh, includes, the other side of this, is being able to manipulate 2D and 3D objects uh, with your hands. And that, I mean, guys, that is exactly what we're doing with a, with a Rubik's Cube, is we're learning how to manipulate it. Um, and so, to me, I don't even, I, I don't understand why NASA isn't handing a Rubik's Cube to every astronaut. Like, this exactly aligns with what they're trying to do. Um, so that, that's exactly why I decided to try to do this experiment uh, with a Rubik's Cube in a space-like environment, because I, I do see a great benefit between the two. So now people are like, okay, that's really cool that they're looking for this, Bailey, for astronauts. Why does this even, like, why are they even looking for this, you know? Well, I wanted to give you guys some examples. So the first thing is that, like, when it comes to space, I'm gonna say something you guys all know. There's no gravity, you know? <laughs> Everything just kind of floats away and stuff like that. So what this helps with, this, this 3D spatial awareness, not only does it help with this, like, in front of you, thinking about this, um, but it helps you conceptualize where you are in the world and how the world is interacting with you. Um, so that's a huge thing when you're floating around and you're not used to there being no gravity and you throw a tool over here or something like that. You have to be able to conceptualize where things are going to be in space. And I'm not talking like outer space, I'm talking about like space around you. Um, and, and kind of similarly to that, when you turn a Rubik's Cube, so I want to get this one here, right? So when I do that, look, I did that. But I also have to think about how this side is now in this position. You know what I mean? I have to think about how this action over here affects back here. And so that's a really important thing in space as well, that Rubik's Cubes are helping me train. So that's a really good example. The other thing is, like I said, being able to manipulate things with your hands, having this fine motor control, and these quick muscles to do things like that. So why does that matter? Um, so when it comes down to astronauts, you guys understand that the, a lot of them are pilots, you know what I mean? And, and, um, and they have to do a lot of really cool fine-tuning science experiments, and a lot of times they might be wearing these bulky gloves. So that's a really good example. Pilots have, you know, joysticks or they have all the commands and the buttons they need to be pushing. Um, if, if, you can, if you can do a, a Rubik's Cube, the goal is you can do that too. The other thing I wanted to talk about along those lines is uh, one of my favorite topics. I'm so excited. The International Space Station. Here's another picture for you guys. Oh my gosh. If you're like me, your heart just gets happy when you see this picture. I love the International Space Station. Um, it's, it's floating around right now. It's in orbit around Earth. And actually, we are about to celebrate a really, really big day for the ISS. Um, it's, it's on November 2nd of 2020. We are going to be celebrating 20 years of continuous human presence in space. This is insane. We've never done this before. That means someone has always been on the International Space Station since the year 2000. That means for the last 20 years, humanity has not all been in one place. There's been always at least three people on the International Space Station in space. So it's a really exciting anniversary that's coming up. That, I mean, it's, it's a great way to, to celebrate the amazing accomplishments of human feet, basically, and, and human engineers and ingenuity and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm really proud of kind of what we've been doing as a team for this. Um, but specifically on the International Space Station, um, there's this really cool component. I'm excited to share it with you guys. Um, International Space Station obviously is international. Now the modules that we see, these are where the astronauts are living and working over here. You can see that. Um, they all come from different um, countries. We have uh, NASA, part of the USA, and Russia both contributed the major components. We also have kind of smaller hubs uh, modules that were given to us, uh, given to the ISS from JAXA in Japan and ESA, the European Space Agency. So when we say this is an international space station, it really is. And that's another thing I love about it is despite what's going down on the ground on Earth, all these tensions and stuff that we're having, we're still working together up in space to have amazing things happen. Now, what I want to talk to you about is actually from Canada. This is it. This is the Canadian arm. I don't know if you can see it. I think it says Canada on it. Where does it say Canada? Right there. It's upside down. Um, this is the Canadian arm, and they created it for the International Space Station um, and, and in efforts to, to be part of this international process. And this thing, guys, this, this, it's a robotic arm, and it is amazing. It's a really interesting concept that the two sides of the arm 
can actually move independently. You can detach either side, which means it can actually walk across, kind of like a, you know, let's pretend like this is the arm. Um, it, it, it will detach this side and flip over. And then when this side detaches again, this side will flip over. And so it can walk along the space station. Um, and it's, it's an absolutely amazing tool. And they use it a lot for like cargo shipments that come up with like food for the astronaut or science experiments. They have storage for that. So the, the arm can pick it up and put it in storage. Um, the other thing they use it for is actually for humans. Uh, astronauts can take a little ride. I hope you guys can see that, right? That, that astronaut right there. What they do is they, they, do, they attach to the arm and then they can stabilize when they are fixing things on the ISS or doing other science experiments um, during their spacewalks. And that's really cool because when all of this is going down, someone has to be controlling the arm. Someone has to make sure the arm knows what it's doing and doing it correctly. Well, think about it. Being able to control a robotic arm like that, especially if there's a human life on the other side of it, it takes a lot of spatial awareness. It takes a lot of cognitive ability and fine-tuned muscle control. So that's what I'm trying to say, guys, is everything we're doing here in this little cube applies to the bigger world and not even the world, into space, which is absolutely amazing. All right, guys, that's all I have for you for STEM Sunday. This month, we talked about what spatial awareness is, how the Rubik's Cube helps train it, and what that means for the astronauts up in space right now. I hope you learned something. I hope you guys are as excited about space as I am. And if you ever have any questions about STEM or space or anything cool, feel free to let me know. And remember, it's an adventure with every turn.